there were no amazing samples 13 years ago like there are today. And the first time I heard like Hans's custom samples, I was like goosebumps. I was like, you, you know, you wanted to write faster than your fingers would move. How did I end up at remote control? It, I guess it starts with me being in college. I, when I was in college, I was an economics major to start and kind of had this curiosity and interest in music um, and ended up studying music as a hobby. And then through a flu connection in my sophomore year, uh, I got a call that says, hey, I met someone that works at Hans Zimmer's studio. Do you have any interest in, in um, interning there over the winter? And I was like, uh, yeah, I, I would. I would, I would love to. I mean, it was Hans. It was, you know, it's such a boring answer to say who's like one of your musical, like biggest influences or idols or whatever. And it's a boring answer, but the truth is it was like, it was Hans. I grew up listening to Hans Zimmer music. Um, so I came out here in the winter and as soon as I showed up here and saw the way that people worked and the way they wrote music and the projects that came through here and just the studios, I was, I was hooked immediately. And so the following summer I came back out uh, interned again for the entire summer, and then the day I graduated, I, uh, I got my car, drove out from New York, um, and a couple weeks later was hired by Ramin uh, as his tech assistant, and did that for a year, was his writing assistant, and kind of slowly just found my, found my way here 10 years later. I'm still figuring out what my sound is and what my style is. I, I don't really know if someone asked me, some people have asked me, like, what is your sound? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Um, so I'm still figuring that out, kind of, but, and I was really figuring that when I started working with Ramin, and at first it was just trying to sound like Ramin, kind of, a and even now, because I'll occasionally help Ramin out on projects doing additional music, the additional music, I still kind of have to sound like him, so I know the way he kind of arranges things, and I know, not really his harmonic language, but the way he uses harmony type of thing, and, and I kind of have to at least stay sort of in that box. I could bring a little bit of what I do differently, but I can't. I can't just veer veer off and because I'd play him something, he'd be like, "This isn't working at all." So, whether consciously or subconsciously, all that remain over the years has probably kind of affected the way, you know, I write music and and, and kind of perceive music. There's a lot. The biggest one being kind of schedule and timeline and stuff. Network TV being the most condensed schedule. Person of interest, which is really where I got a lot of my chops writing and arranging and, and I conducted for the show and ran the sessions and mixed the show. I did a lot of stuff for that show. I'd be like four and a half days to turn around 35 minutes of music from spotting um, to scoring session. So that being the most condensed and then a video being kind of the most most spread out and there's no there's no spotting session we kind of get briefs for levels or kind of descriptions of like two minute pieces three minute pieces they need where they're like okay we need three minutes of like stealth music when you're you know sneaking around at night on the ship this is for like a first person shooter for example and, and um and you you send the music and they're like eh, you know they give they give their feedback but that could go on and off for the longest one I've worked on is, it, it's still going on three and a half years now. It's almost done. Uh, and then movies are, you know, the most straightforward. I say that even though they're usually the most chaotic and in, insane, where you, you spot the film um, and then, and then you know, you write themes, spot the film, and kind of just start chipping away at scenes. Um, I don't work chronologically, so just kind of scattered throughout the film and, and eventually finish. <laughs> There's no real one answer for that. I mean, the number one rule, I think, in this, in this job is that you just have to deliver on time. It doesn't, and obviously they have to, to deliver on time, they have to approve stuff. So I, I think probably the, fir the easiest way to end your career is if you missed delivery for a dub date or something. I mean, that, you might never work on a project again. Um, so how do you shift gears and stuff? It sometimes, you know, you, it's just a discussion with the director and figuring out, you know, what he doesn't like or she doesn't like about the, the music that you've written for the scene or the, the theme you've written or what styles they are feeling or, or you could talk to them at a really simple boiled down like emotional level of like, 
you know, what do you want music's function to be here? Do we want it to kind of really play the emotion? Do you want it to kind of just subtly hint towards the emotion? Do you want it to play against the emotion? Are we, are we too sad? Are we too happy? Are we not heroic enough? Is it just too slow? You know, any adjectives help a lot, uh, even though adjectives are very subjective and it, it, every director, you know, heroic means something else. Sometimes heroic to a director might mean percussion, which is not really, you know, a discovery you have to make just talking with, with them. Um, it, it's just, it's kind of feeling it out on every project. There's no easy way to shift gears. It just, it just kind of has to get done. It's very important to be, to have a plan B. Um, long time ago when I was having lunch with Hans as an intern, uh, someone asked him like, what's the best piece of advice you'd ever uh, gotten? And he said, be able to execute plan B flawlessly, which was kind of lost on me at the time. It didn't really, it didn't really hit home until I was sitting in this chair and I played something for a producer and I was like, do you like it? And they're like, it's really cool music. It's not working for this show. And I was like, wow, gulp. Okay, we just wasted three, three weeks kind of coming up with themes and ideas and all of a sudden we have three less weeks to finish the first episode and we're kind of back at square one. Um, but, you know, you just have to shift gears and we ended up in a completely different direction because of it and it ended up being for the best. You can't have too thin a skin in this job, otherwise you'll go home and cry every night. I mean, because you could be, there's so many times you sit here and you're super proud of something and you play it and some, not even, I mean, sometimes they're just not nice. It's not even like, this is cool music, it's just not working. Sometimes they're like, this sucks. And you're like, you just kind of have to like swallow that tough pill. Sometimes you just might go home and clear your head for the day, right? Get a lot of sleep and then come in the next day with a fresh mind and, and put that entire experience behind you and, and start with, with, a, with a blank canvas again. It's just part of the job. It's, you know, like I said, if you had thin skin, you, you'll go home every night and cry. <laughs> If I really get stuck, and it doesn't work every time, but really get stuck, it just helps me to get out of here sometimes. You know, sometimes the best ideas have come to me when I've just gone for like a long walk, or I've taken my dogs for a long walk, or I've gone to the gym. There's, for some reason, ideas come to me when I'm like, I'm gasping for oxygen. So I, I'm, I, I play soccer also. So sometimes, um, you know, uh, I'll be up just to sprinted or I'll be at the gym gasping for air and all of a sudden I get this idea that comes comes out of nowhere and, and so that I guess would be my secret weapon it and then sometimes you just have to sit in this chair and just keep on throwing crap at the wall until something sticks but I always if I get stuck at least try taking a big step out of the studio for if there's no time at least half a day just to kind of like and try not to overthink anything so I, in college, I very first started learning how to write music kind of with paper and pencil and, and then in Finale, which is just the most awful, 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 like generic general MIDI sounds ever conceived by mankind. Um, and then it was after I came here that I, that I got GarageBand and Logic where I was like, I need to learn how to sequence. But I came here thir 13 years ago when the rigs were actually a little bit more complicated than they are now, like MIDI over LAN didn't exist, VN Ensemble didn't exist, so it was, it was hardwired connections and stuff, and everyone had like, you know, 17 stacks of samplers, and I was like, I saw that, I was like, I I'll never learn this. Someone tried explaining signal flow to me, and it was just like, I'll never understand how any of this works. And the first time I heard like Hans's custom samples, I was like, goosebumps. I was like, I was like, oh my God. Um, it, it was so inspiring. It's like you just wanted to, you know, you wanted to write faster than your fingers would move. Like you were just, you know, there was so much music going on. I was like, how, how can I get this down faster hearing all these sounds? And then, you know, fast forward to now, you know, samples have a really, 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 really f important function in, in this job. And when you hear new samples, they're inspiring, but for a much shorter period of time it, where you're just, you're craving live performances and working with live musicians to come in and like kind of breathe life into into um into the music you know it so that's that i have like a love-hate relationship with samples now where i you know i was just so enamored by them at first anyone would be the first time you come here and you hear especially if you don't come from you know there were no amazing samples 13 years ago like there are today like there's there's just you know there's 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 lots of options 
and hearing that to now where I'm just like, I cannot wait to get this in front of like an orchestra or a, a violinist or a, or, or a singer or whatever it is. I guess I first started sequencing in GarageBand, which is free if you have if you have a Mac. That's really kind of where I started figuring out sequencing before I moved to Logic, and now and now my Cubase. Um, so Garage GarageBand's a good free software, and then there's a ton of amazing plugins. There's a ton of amazing samples that are very relatively uh, cheap. There's something called Freak Show Industries. They're creative plugins. These ones they do like. They're backwards mashers and distortion plugins, and I don't know, they're really cheap. And orchestral tools, you guys have like the Majestic Horn. Does that sound right? That thing is amazing uh, for just like that solo, warm, round, legato horn that, um, which I think it's like four bucks. Is that is that right? Three, three bucks. There you go. So that's, I mean, that's not free, but I think everyone could can 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 stomach a three three dollar kind of uh, investment for if you need solo French horn. Um, yeah, and then you know, occasionally if you spend enough time surfing the web, you'll find you know EQs that are ninety percent off for like eight bucks or delays that are ten dollars and stuff. So you know, there's lots of cheap stuff out there to be found if you just kind of spend the time looking. I know this is like a hotly debated topic about, you know, you should never write music for free and, and, and everything, but not everything has a financial value tied to it. If you think you're getting something out of it by, you know, getting linked up with a great director, or you get to work on a great film that you think is going to get exposure, or um, you get to write in a style that you just don't have on your demo reel, or, or or whatever. I mean, you just want to do it for because you just you think it's going to be a really fun experience. Those are all things that are valuable. You shouldn't ever do anything for free, but that doesn't mean not for money. You you know, there's so many stories out there of composers who have taken a chance doing something just so they get to work with a director or just to work on a film, and it, it's really kind of taken their career and, and, and catapulted it into this trajectory that has led them to be very successful. Well, thank you for having us here. Thank you guys for coming. This was this was a lot of fun.